Total Wine & More now offers curbside pickup and same-day delivery in Northern Virginia. Have great finds at great prices delivered right to your car or to your door. It's easy to discover the more ways Total Wine & More has you covered at TotalWine.com. Welcome, readers. Today on Book Chat, joining me is my Buddy Reads co-host, Classy Green. We'll be discussing The Sundown Motel by Simone St. James. Stay tuned. Hey everyone, I'm your host, Tamara Ford, and thank you for downloading this month's Buddy Read discussion featured here on the Shelf Addiction Podcast. If you're new here, every week we get bookish with book discussions, book review shelf bites, and more. If you are wondering what is a Buddy Read, this is a feature where Classy and I select a thriller or mystery title that we both are interested in. Then we have a candid discussion about that book or audiobook. We even discuss it in our Facebook group, Shelf Addiction Official during a live chat. So grab a glass of wine, a cocktail, cup of tea or coffee or whatever your drink of choice is and settle in for this fun discussion. As always with book chats, there is a spoiler alert in effect. So you've been warned. If you enjoyed today's episode, please support this podcast by sharing it with one book nerd friend or on your favorite social media space. That would really help me out and I appreciate you for doing it. The uncut video version of this podcast is available now on Patreon. Join us there for exclusive videos, including this podcast after show. You can find both Classy and myself on Instagram and Twitter. And if you're reading or listening to this audiobook and would like to contribute to the conversation, of course, be sure to join the Shelf Addiction official Facebook group. I hope to hear your thoughts on this discussion. The links for everything I've mentioned are below in the show notes. We've got a lot to cover today, so we are going to jump right on in. Joining me is the Buddy Read feature co-host, Classy Green. Welcome back, Classy. Thank you for allowing me to come back once again, Tamara. Once again. <laughs> I know. Uh, yes, we're going to have some fun today. <laughs> yes. No, so I can't wait to to hear your uh, thoughts as, as, uh, as we go over this book. Okay, I made lots of notes, so uh, <laughs> we are discussing the audiobook version of The Sundown Motel, written by Simone St. James, narrated by Brittany Presley and Chris Kirsten Potter. The length is about nine hours, and it was released February 18th, 2020. So before we get going, Classy, as always, would you please share the synopsis? Yes. The Sundown Motel by Simone St. James. The secrets lurking in a rundown roadside motel ensnare a young woman, just as they did her aunt 35 years before, in this new atmospheric suspense novel from the national best-selling and award-winning author of The Broken Girls. Upstate New York, 1982. Every small town like Bell, New York, has a place like the Sundown Motel. Some customers are from out of town, passing through on their way to someplace better. Some are locals trying to hide their secrets. Viv Delaney works as the night clerk to pay for her move to New York City, but something isn't right at the sundown, and before long, she's determined to uncover all of the secrets hidden. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. And that she does, that she does. Yes, um, yes. So you guys know full spoilers. Okay, if you are new here, if you're brand spanking new, we are going to spoil it. So if you haven't read it, press pause and then come back. (laughs) Don't say we didn't warn you. Right, we can't say, "Uh, about this time we'll warn you about spoilers. Mm. Yeah. We cannot be held responsible for what we say. at any moment exactly so uh it i know you guys are gonna like what we have to say i think um or maybe i okay so let's just start uh i thought at first i'm like when is this stuff gonna pick up it took a minute um for the pacing or or things for things to get interesting for me let's say it that way it took about i can't remember what i told you the percentage was do you remember what i told 23 23 23 Right. And that's a lot for me. That's like quarter through quarter, almost quarter way through the book before things started to get interesting. How about for you? Was it slow start uh, for you? I believe so, because 
I think I even looked at my percentage mark to, to see if I was probably right around the same point you were at where I was like, okay, slow burn. Cause you know how I am with slow burn. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, I don't mind slow burn if it's going to be good, but you know, at the beginning it's just like, Oh, mm-hmm. hook me, mm-hmm. just hook me, please. Mm-hmm. And I, it took me probably about that long to, um, yeah, I would say right about that time because that's when things I think started to reveal itself. Like, okay, now let's see where they're going. Even though the synopsis is, is perfect, yeah. it still doesn't give away a whole lot. No, it doesn't actually. Yeah. Um, I think maybe what slowed it down in the beginning is honestly <laughs> the chapters were, I guess, noted that it was either 1982 or it was 2017. Uh, And I needed that in the beginning because even with the two narrators, it took me several chapters to figure out. And I found, I actually remember hitting back to the beginning of the chapter at least five times. So I like, wait a minute. (laughs) Where, what time time are we in? Yeah. Yeah. But eventually that, went away when, when I got into the story, but it shocked me how many times in the very beginning I had to do that. Yeah, because the narrators did sound, at, at, at a certain point, they did start sounding alike, but then like you said too, you could kind of tell um, just because of some of the scenes, some of the comments, um, uh, because at the beginning, what's her name? Oh, what's the niece's Viv- name? Oh, the niece, um, her name. Carly. Carly, yeah. Carly. I don't think, like, in that first 20%, there wasn't a whole lot given to us about Carly. It was mostly Viv's story, am I right? Uh, Yeah, but Carly did show up in Fells and find a little impromptu roommate in the beginning. Right, but within that 20%, was it? I think so, yeah. Um, Okay. But it did start with Viv. Uh, Vivian because we had to figure out what the hell is going on (laughs) so she she goes away from home is intending to go to New York but finds herself in this small town trying to escape from someone who she thinks could just dump her on the side of the road and murder her she gets a ride like that's horror film mistake number one yeah you hitch a ride with a guy who suddenly is creeping you out yeah, because she left home because her and her mom had gotten to it. Uh, dad had left the family. They were getting, you know, divorced and her and mom weren't getting along. She was going to New York to become an actress with, what, $100 in her pocket, maybe? Mm-hmm. Never <laughs> made it to New York. Oh, well. Right. And then she was down to her last $20 and decided to hitchhike, like you said, and and um, realized she was in the car with uh, a possible Ted Bundy. <laughs> and on their way there, she sees a hotel or motel and says, um, oh, just drop me off here because she was getting the creeps, you know, that mm-hmm. women's intuition and uh, decided to to stay there. Which you should always listen to, by the way, if you ever get that yes. feeling get the hell out of there <laughs> it's given to yep it's given to you for a reason mm-hmm. yeah and she tells the clerk uh, who happens to be the owner hey i only have twenty dollars to my name how much um is a room and the rooms were 30 she only had 20 and in exchange for her um living there the the clerk slash owner said hey take over the night shift We'll take a nap (laughs) and come back. You got a job and you have somewhere to to lay your head for the night. And thus begins her story. Mm -hmm. Which I I mean, overall, I felt the story was very compelling. It was very interesting to me how Viv in 1982 and Carly in 2017 were basically mirroring each other as far as, you know, they both end up in this town. They both are working the night shift. They both have these obscure roommates. They both <laughs> are trying to solve a crime. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it, it was, it was eerie mm-hmm. because, and I think that 
that provided that as- atmospheric tone because each time you hear everybody's story, you're like, what's really going on here? Are they really two different ca- You know, it's like you just, there's so many scenarios that can be taking place, even though, you know, it's 2017 and it's 1982, but you, you know, you've had some stories that will, you know, with the unreliable narrator, which I didn't feel like this was, but I wasn't sure if she was just going to try and throw something at us, you know, something mm-hmm. real slick or a nice twist. But, mm-hmm. um, but they were, they mirrored practically, like you said, all the way down to the roommate, to the, the, the living quarters. I mean, her roommate, uh, Carly's roommate, when she came to fell, because she knew her aunt's address, you know, that was the apartment. Yeah. So here she goes to look at her aunt's apartment, and this woman needs a roommate. Mm-hmm. How weird. <laughs> yeah, and she was a little strange. I mean, she had issues. The roommate had all these prescription drugs because she was depressed, and she had all these things going on. So yeah, I don't know if she, she was the best. With bipolar. Yeah, but I guess it worked out. <laughs> yeah, because she... She was an insomniac who who loved doing, you know, when she couldn't sleep, she was on the internet and had possibly looked. I mean, it was a small town. Mm-hmm. I can't remember if they even mentioned the the count, you know, m- the population. But, you know, it was a small town. And how many women went missing? I'll say a at lot. least five. Well, four, well, four yeah. that were named. Plus, there could right. be more. More. Right. So yeah. in that small town, which I didn't look up to see if Fell, New York was a real town, which I doubt um, because, you know, they mentioned like Fell College or something. And I'm like, eh, this is probably very fictional. But, you know, with a small town like that, um, just to have even four or five women go missing is, you know, monumental for that city. So I could see her on her time of not being able to sleep doing that I thought that was very believable yeah me too yeah it was crazy like who the small town where just people are people die at the motel women are yanked off the street and they're used as cautionary tales to to scare the daughters yeah you'll wind up like so-and-so don't go out jogging right I mean it brought up memories from my childhood I don't know about you Well, lucky for me, uh, if there were a bunch of serial killers running around uh, that they were talking about on the news, I just wasn't aware of it. (laughs) I mean, when I was a teenager, I didn't hear any crazy stories from my parents or anybody. But I feel like there if I Google that back, I find there was something going on because I do remember like a distinct time uh, when maybe I was like maybe under the age of 10. But I remember my father and my mother telling me, like, if anyone comes to you and says they are here on our behalf, it's a lie. (laughs) If anyone says come with us, you know, don't believe them, run. And then they actually made up a code word that literally made it up. I, the sky, this is not a real word. I still remember it. They're like, if by chance we ever send someone to you, they will know this word. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> ah, so yeah, so it probably was some kind of incident. That yeah, happened. and that's how they chose to deal with it is to like warn me not to go with people. Yeah, um, without saying, yeah. "Oh, don't do this, or you'll end up like this girl." <laughs> right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I remember some, you know, some stories, and some of the stories weren't in my town, but you know, yeah. were just national news. So that was, like you said, the opportunity for my parents to to caution us about, um, staying out late, staying in groups, um, especially for young girls and empowering us. So, so yeah, I really did think, um, the characters were believable, the plot. I mean, you know, there's a few little things in there, um, that some people may not think are, is believable, but I enjoyed it. Look, girl, okay, even the ghost stuff, okay, I I halfway (laughs) accepted it, okay, because... Yeah, I know. Let me tell you, like, I am not one of these people that are like, oh, there's ghosts everywhere, you know, I don't, that's not my normal train of thought, but it has been an occasion or two that I remember, well, three, 
that I remember where I know I have seen something that did not belong. <laughs> and I mean, from childhood yeah. through like adulthood, I saw, I saw something like when I was in middle school, something when I was in high school, and then something as a grown ass adult about like 10 years ago. So I'm like, yep. okay, I, I can believe something. So I think this kind of made it more interesting. Yeah, I agree. Um, I've had that same experience. Um, childhood, middle, adult. And I've had that experience more than once during those periods in my life. So um, like you said, you know, figures or, and, and, and it wasn't like I was sleeping. I was wide awake and I'm like, mm-hmm. okay. Mm-hmm. I was not on any, you know, and as a child, no, I was not on any medication. Nope. I was not drinking, <laughs> you no know, drugs. and even as an adult during those yeah. times. Yeah, Mm -hmm. so it was no influence. So for those um, incidents to happen, and just to let the the listeners know, um, in the hotel, it was mentioned that it was haunted, Mm -hmm. um, that a woman's body was left um, dumped there before the Sundown Motel was built, and that she haunted this motel um, the whole time. So, and there would be incidences of doors opening. Was it lights being flicked on yeah, and off? All too? the lights would go off. Like this is the yeah. kind of place I would never stay because we talked about hotel motels that have doors to the outside. Okay. When you open your door, it nope. is air. <laughs> I, don't, I can't stay there. Um, so <laughs> right. all, all the I mean, lights would no. go out. The, the sign would go out. Doors would open and slam. Yeah, she'd yeah. see a little boy, uh, you know, all kind of crazy shit. Kind of smell smoke, someone smoking and no one is there. Yeah. Now, I've had that experience before. I've had the smell of smoke and perfume and mm-hmm. no one smokes in my house. I have asthma. My daughter has asthma. Um, but and, and I, it wasn't in this house. I can't remember, but I've had that experience. And you're just like, does anybody else smell that? <laughs> or yeah. is it just me that smells that? Or, you know, like perfume. Like, I don't really wear perfume. My daughter wears it now, but at that time, she was a little girl and didn't wear perfume. Yeah. So, yeah, those those factors in the book brought this up a notch for me. Yeah, because I do, I mean, that stuff, I, I felt it in my bones. I'm like, I would not be sitting there. I don't care what the hell I'm researching. You best believe I'm not about to be sitting up here at night by myself with these weirdos coming in and out of here. No. And all they had to do back then was sign a ledger. Mm -hmm. And half the time, if nobody was at the desk, they knew what to do. That was the thing that got me. (laughs) I'm like, who does this? But apparently it was common practice. Yeah. I'm thinking it was common practice that they would just, oh, okay, she's not here. I'll just leave the key here or I'll just do that and you know I'm afraid of gas stations at night like if I had to have a job I would not be a gas station attendant on the night shift I would not be in the motel anything 24 hours um no I'm scary Mary I'm good no, man I can't I can't do it and especially no. to now it's worse than ever because I w- no. watch and listen to a lot of true crime so it's like hell no you ain't catching me nowhere like that i'm sorry yep nope i need you i i need you to close at nine or ten o'clock p.m <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna do any kind of job like that nope, nope, nope. 24 hours uh-uh. i can't nope, do I'm it mm-hmm. no yeah. yeah it was really interesting how like so viv when she got there she really had no plan but once she started seeing the ghost and hearing the stories she decided I'm going to figure out kind of what happened here uh, because she kind of fell into it. And before you knew it, she was chasing a serial killer. I know. I, and, and the way she figured this out, um, it's like she kind of just snuck up on it. That Because, I mean, in this motel, there were very seedy characters coming through here. There was the drug dealer that everybody knew. Mm-hmm. Um, was this Jamie? Uh, you had the couple that was cheating. Uh, the the cheating couple, Helen um, and Mr. Both White. Of them were married. Right, Helen yeah. Bannister or whatever her name was, and mm-hmm. uh, Mr. White. Um, 
And then Mrs. Bailey, the resident drunk, who would come and just yes. pass out. Right, because she couldn't drink at home. Mm-hmm. And then you had the traveling salesman. Yep. And, you know, and she was practically new. And um, like I said, they all they had to do was sign a ledger. And she realized that the traveling salesman um, wrote down a different name each time he stayed at the hotel. Um, and I think, I, I can't remember exactly why that piqued her interest or, um, oh, the, the, um, oh gosh, what was it? The cop, the night, the, the night shift cop who did security of the hotel. Um, I guess she mentioned to her about the strange ghost or what, is that what happened? Did she mention the... No. Um, oh. I, th- I think if I remember correctly, Viv saw the ghost and I think she was trying to ask Alma about it, but she was kind of just telling her, you know, weird stuff happens. You know, I don't think okay. she was trying to like say right, yeah. she wasn't sure if anybody would believe her probably. Mm-hmm. Cause okay. I don't even know if Alma ever actually saw a ghost. I know that she knew shady mm-hmm. stuff went on up there. Right. Because even Vivian tried to play coy. Mm-hmm. She's like, I don't know. That's not my business or something. So, yeah, but she was trying to figure out, did anybody, what strange had happened there? Because I think somebody mentioned to her, I don't know who mentioned to her that somebody died there. Well, she knew about the little boy because, you know, she lived in that town. So the little boy that drowned in the, uh, he hit his head and he drowned. And then she knew about William, the smoking, what was his name, William? The sm- Henry, the smoking yeah. man. Um, mm-hmm. She knew about him because he worked in that office and sat in that chair. And he was the guy that called emergency for that little boy. So she knew right. about those stories. And of course, she knew about all the lo- other stories because she kind of took them around town. Or was that Marnie that took her around town? Was that... Alma or Marnie, Marnie took, took her. Okay, so. Marnie took her around town, but Alma knew, like you said, the stories because that mm-hmm. was her ship. That was the only ship they would let her work. So she knew everybody who had worked at the motel mm-hmm. and the stories, probably that went along with them. Yeah, but so, Alma yeah. was very okay. about the facts, right? Um, yeah, because every time they would come to her like the couple of times she came to her with evidence even when she had really good like a really good case uh, against uh Hess she said hey you can't prove this though this is all hearsay basically none of this can be proven which is true which made Vivian even a bet you know better at her her um detective research skills because you know, Alma was like, um, I'm I'm the only woman. They already call me names. Nobody's going to believe me. So if we're going to bring this, we got to bring it. We, yeah. Like I said, the facts. I need clear cut evidence, no jokes, um, you know, nothing that would throw this out or no, nothing that would make anyone look over the case and just say, oh, like you said, it's hearsay. So no, she was, she was, she was no nonsense. Um, but she did, you know, at first she seemed like a hard nose, but she did have a soft heart. You could see that she had a soft heart for this young girl who, like she said, she was a pretty young girl who came from Midwest, small Midwest town, even though it was New York city in a small town, (laughs) but it was a creepy small town. Um, and she worked a night nice shift, a uh, uh, unsafe, a very unsafe um, shift. So I, I liked, I liked Elma. There weren't two, you know, there were some characters I didn't like, but I really did like Elma. And I liked Marnie and, you know, the, the women that Vivian came across. And I do want to point out yeah, both okay. of those women were Black. The one that helped Actually, both of them helped Vivian and Carly. Yeah, they did. And I mean, they helped Vivian. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> they helped her to the very end. So they let's talk would. about that. I kind of want to just, just talk about like the murder and stuff. So Vivian got to the point where she was stalking. And I mean, stalking that guy. Uh, what's his dang on name? Uh, Simon Hess. Simon Hess. Yes. Um, Cause she's like, I'm proving this. So it got to the point where during one of her stalking uh, days, she sees him um, s- scoping out this girl, this high school girl. Uh, and I think yeah. after that, she went to Alma. She tried to warn people. She called the school and tried to pretend she was a parent talking about this strange guy. She sent a note to the parents because like, hey, there's some guy watch your kid and nobody believed her and so (laughs) the kid is snatched up raped and killed and so after that I think she just was at her wits end and she like I can't (laughs) I mean I tried she's done all she can do (laughs) yeah I tried to save her and I still didn't save her so of course when the guy comes back He's all, okay, well, actually, let's talk about how he finds her. Because, y'all, this ending was crazy. So, Viv was, I guess, mistaken as a blackmailer. So, Mr. White and Helen, who always come and screw each other in that room. Okay, they got a room. They were doing it. Then, Robert White was blackmailed by Helen. Because Helen's husband had her getting photos taken of her by Marnie. So that they could then later, as a couple, blackmail this guy with, I'm going to tell your wife if you don't pay this money. But he didn't think it was Helen. He thought it was poor Viv. So he confronts her and starts to strangle her to death. He's trying to strangle a girl. Are you assaulting that lady? (laughs) Right, right, right. So Mr. (laughs) Serial Killer, Simon Hess, walks up and he's like, are you assaulting this lady? Like, you know, he just inserts himself in the business. I'm like, what? That shocked me, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> but in her right. mind, she's like, hey, Mr. White, I know you just strangled me, but please don't leave me alone with this serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> oh my Put God. Put back around my neck. <laughs> <laughs> it was hilarious. But, you know, so he checks in and of course he says something sly to her and she like, oh my God. She thinks he knows her. he's figured her out, but he hadn't yet. Right. Right. I thought the same thing, like, oh, the gig is up. Yeah. The gig is up. But but she she had a smart plan, though. So White goes to his room. Um, I'm sorry. Hess goes to his room. White leaves, of course, drops the money, the the money that he was supposed to pay off the blackmailer. And uh, so she has. Oh, but you forgot that while she's getting choked, uh, Mrs. Bannister drives up and sees oh yep mr white choking her and it's like drives i'm out of here she's like look i'm out of here Gigs up. <laughs> i don't want that money <laughs> right like the blackmailing lady drives up sees it and takes off i'm like damn you just gonna leave a girl to get choked out <laughs> right she's giving her eye contact like help help Nah. <laughs> like not my business she's like <laughs> now in 18, 1982 there are no cell phones to call 911 okay right. not like that yeah. no nope not I at mean, all that might have been about the time where they started having those huge chunky car phones that you have to have plugged into the lighter in a bag yeah in yes. a bag that might <laughs> maybe no, you know what? The bag phones were, yeah, that might have been the brick phones, maybe. Okay. That might have been brick phone time. Oh my gosh. Yeah. But I, we know, I remember the bag phone because <laughs> uh, one Christmas my father bought one and we were like, bring the phone. When we got the car, we had to go grab the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I remember those. Oh, I remember those. Uh, yeah. So, okay. So, um, so everyone disperses and then her friend, Jamie, who is the pot drug dealer that has been flirting with, um, no, no, I'm thinking the wrong person. So, um, was that Jamie? That was the pot dealer. Yeah. 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 Jamie, the pot dealer who had been flirting with Viv the whole time. 
she gets help from him. She has him call up there to the room, to the serial killer Hess's room, and says, hey, I know what you did. I saw you. You better come here in 20 minutes or else. <laughs> so he hightails his butt Meet out of there. Me in the lobby. Yes. Yeah. And then, of course, Viv's like, this is my chance to go find some evidence. I'm like, oh, Lord, that's never going to work out. And, of course, it didn't. Nope. Nancy Drew. Yeah. She com- she goes in there. She searches, searches, searching. And then here he comes, like, what are you doing? <laughs> He's like, very busted. Busted. And she's like, uh. <laughs> He's like, it was you. I knew it was you. So she gets right. bust, cold busted. And, um, right, because when he checks in, he keeps yeah. looking at her and says, you look familiar. Yep. And she's like, yeah, I look familiar. You check in here all the time. He's like, no, I know you from somewhere else. And she, you know, she dodged it for she a while. Did. Until, like you said, she got caught in that room. You know what? She, I think he did for sure thought he, if he didn't know for sure, he thought he saw her at the bus stop. Remember that scene where she was um, tra- tracking him and then like she kind of right. got busted almost, but she kind of got in the line to get on the bus and just would not look at him. Right. Yes. Yeah. So he definitely saw her there. And of course, uh, she broke into his vehicle. <clears throat> he didn't physically see her at yes. the time, but he probably seen her car around a few times. Right. That's what I was thinking too, that that car was around enough times. And if he's checked into that hotel or excuse me, it's a motel mm-hmm. enough times that he's seen that car mm-hmm. because it wasn't that many patrons at the car at the motel. So he noticed her car. Oh yeah. Between him, it was like one, two, three, like five other people at that motel at any given time outside right. of the yep. the person at the front desk. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. Oh, yeah so, I think he did have an inkling. Uh-huh. Do, what did you think about him? Like, and this is like typical in like a lot of mysteries. So they catch somebody or somebody is figured out. Then they proceed to spill their whole guts before <laughs> it's like before you get got, you spill your entire guts about everything you did and you tee in about it before you get got. That's what happened. Right. Cause you don't think you're gonna get got. Yeah, that's the classic. I'll never get caught. Yeah, I did it. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just it was cliche. Mm-hmm. Um very cliche because what I think she basically questioned him and asked him why he did it mm-hmm. and like you said he 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 said because I can because I got away with it, it. Right. right I liked it I liked mm-hmm. um what was it the first lady Betty I loved Betty she just didn't know she loved me mm-hmm. <laughs> and I needed to show her creeper um and like you said he was just a classic serial killer um rapist basically you know the only he, girl that didn't get raped was the runner and i think that was because he said he messed something up and it was kind of like things got messy and he just had to kill her yeah right it was one of those she threw me off my game and mm-hmm. i had to to wing it mm-hmm. yeah that's why one girl didn't fit the profile that Alma was saying like that doesn't fit all the way um, yeah but so he killed Four women plus some, because he kind of alluded to there might have been more, yeah. but they were nameless. So Betty Graham, that was the ghost. That was the first person he killed ever. Yeah. And then Kathy Caldwell, he snatched her out of her home. He sold her locks. Remember um, the married uh, woman the, who yeah. got slandered after she disappeared? Yep. And then, Victor- mom. Yeah. Yep. And then Victoria Lee, who was a runner. She was the one that did not get raped. So I think he yeah. just yanked her dirt while she was out running. And then of course the high school kid, like he's just getting younger and younger. It's gross. Tracy Walter is the yeah. high school kid. And then more women that, that she was unable to get the, the names for. Yeah. And Tracy was the first, um, well, when the story opened, Vivian said, Tracy, I'm sorry I failed you, in which I thought was a very good line to start a book off with because it's like 
because at that time, let's see, and which we didn't know, but that was, was like one of the first lines in the book, I think, because I remember tagging it and or like she was going in to work or something. Mm -hmm. And she mentioned, you know, hey, they found Tracy in the ditch, uh, stripped of her clothes. um, And she was like, who does that? Blah, blah, blah. And then she said, Tracy, I'm sorry, I failed you. And I was like, that's important. And then we come to find out that Tracy, um, the day Tracy's body was found was also the day Vivian went missing. Yeah. And. And, you know, and this, and this is what happened. She was trying to find out who was killing these girls in this small town. So now, you know what? OK, so I could tell I knew what happened. I can't I should have wrote down the exact moment, but I knew she killed him before we got to that point. I was like. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh no, she killed him and ran. I don't know what point. I wish I wrote it down because I I guessed that. I'm like, well, mm-hmm. at first I'm thinking, well, I guess Vivian's the last person he's gonna kill. But then, oh, I know what it was. When they were in the garage and they opened up, you know, they couldn't open the trunk, but they knew some a body was in there. Remember when Vivian and um no, I'm sorry, when when Carly and Carly, yeah, the older girl of Carly Nick? and Nick were in that garage because right. remember they were doing their own investigation. What happened to Viv? When they were right. they went to that garage based off of photos that Marnie took. She took right. a photo of where they buried him or put his body. Um, when they saw that, I thought, "Oh no!" I'm like, "Watch, she she's not in there." And then the very yeah. next section, the police was like, uh, that's not her. It's a man. I said, oh, shit, she killed him. That's the first thing I said. She killed him. It ran. Yeah. Yep. That's what I thought, too. It yeah. thought, well, I, I thought ran and, and, and just like the story said, and got a new person, a uh, new identity, mm-hmm. which, which is she what did. happen. Yeah. 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 But she had help. It was dope how she had help, though. Um, so fast forward, she does. I didn't think that that they threw me off. She she got me with that one. Yeah, and really, so okay, so after Viv, she stabs him in the stomach and then stabs him in the neck two different times. Um, right, <laughs> I would stab his ass more than that. But um, so she stabs him and then she panics and she calls Alma. At the police station. And then yeah. suddenly she's like, oh, never mind. I'm just bored. You know, she tried to play it off like she didn't want her to come. And she reached out to her for help initially. And she just changed her mind at the last minute. But Alma was like, what's going on with this girl? Let me go over here and see what the hell going on. But not before Marnie shows up. Marnie shows up first. And they she is the one helping her get the body into the car. As they get the body into the car, here comes Alma rolling up. And they like standing there and she got this bloody uh <laughs> she got a bloody uh shower curtain in her hand. <laughs> and she's like what's both of them caught with their hands right. in a cookie jar right and she's like uh what's going on here and they're like uh <laughs> they, they didn't want to she help. did it <laughs> <laughs> but i mean i'm so smart she knew what the hell was going on and she's like okay yeah all right. And like, honestly, as a cop, you think her first inkling would be to arrest her, but it was to save her. It was to help her. Yeah. Because I think yeah, after the last girl died, she felt guilty because, you know, she warned her. Right. And I think she said she had noticed some things, too. She had looked up some things and realized he was the serial killer. If I, I think that was mentioned that she did know from some evidence that it did prove, but it wasn't like you said, because Alma was by the book, facts, Mm -hmm. nothing but facts. And I think she knew, but she didn't have enough to prove that this guy was a serial killer. And she also knew um, that he possibly would get away with it or he wouldn't serve too much time because it was, it was circumstantial evidence. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah, he told her. Yeah, he did. But, but who, that was your word against 
his word. And now right. he's a dead man. So, you know, Elma may have been, you know, working that nice shit, but she knew her shit. Yes, she did. <laughs> she, yes, she, she knew did. her stuff. Yeah. So between the two of them, Marnie and Elma helped her disappear, basically. You know, Marnie was like, I'll go take care of this body. And Elma was like, we're leaving. Leave all your stuff. Leave everything. Yeah. And the only thing she grabbed was that cash, that blackmail cash. Hmm, and start off, a new life. Yes, off into the night you go. Yeah. Which was insane, though. An insane twist which was weird in like in the most gross way. So like the reason why, you know, the serial killer has kept coming back to that hotel is because he saw Betty's ghost and he was getting his rocks off by seeing the ghost over and over again. And so that's why he kept coming back to that hotel. And that's awful. And then after all of that, his ass turns into a damn ghost. At the hotel. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I know it was like you almost wonder. Well. Yeah, because you almost wonder, like, so who became the ghost? It seems like the people who died there mm-hmm. became the ghost. Even though I think Betty, did, I'm not positive if Betty was, well, Betty was jumped there, period. So we could just say she basically haunted the land. It's just like, you know, yeah. <clears throat> when someone's ground, dumped, she haunted Yeah, I, your body. Yeah. And I don't know if she was officially dead when he dumped her. She could have been near death, but not all the way dead. Right. Right. Because the other ghost was the little boy who died in the pool. Mm-hmm. Um Henry the smoker had a stroke or a heart attack yep. at work at the motel. In that same chair had, she be sitting in every day. Yeah. Wow, nobody told them anything. And then Hess was killed there too. So I heard, yeah. So right. So I guess, you know, that's how the ghost um came about in that hotel was um if you died on that property, you haunted the place basically. Mm-hmm. Um or your ghost appeared. And I won't say haunt. Because I mean, because the little boy wasn't haunting. He just was kind of appearing saying, I don't feel I don't feel good. You know, that was he wasn't me like out. trying to scare. He wasn't tearing anything no, up. He, he, he wasn't. Just didn't feel good. But he was like, Help me, help me. I'm like, oh my God. Right. And look at one point, I feel like, was that Carly? I think it was Carly who said to the little boy, I can't help you. I can't right. help you. I, can't. <laughs> I gotta go. I gotta go. I hope you. I hope you feel better. Yeah, but I gotta go. <laughs> yeah, like You're stopping oh. progress. <laughs> yeah, because then, yeah. thirty-five years later, Carly is sitting there seeing the same ghost, smelling the smoke, finding out about Betty. Um, you know all these things that she's really seeing. I think the full effect of that, especially at the end there, because. When Hess's grandson comes to try, which didn't make sense to me. Why? You're the grandson of this serial killer. But he just thought he ran away with his, her aunt. I think that's what it was. He thought they ran away or something. Um, right. But when they found out that that wasn't what happened, he blamed her. He was like, he called what he said. He called her some kind of bitch or something. Like right yeah. before he like knocks her upside the head. I'm like, what is wrong? Yeah. He says, Fuck you, bitch, and knock her up. Right. I'm like, what? You gonna push her into the pool? Oh my god! I'm like, this is crazy. Yeah, but they said he did suffer from something. And yeah, yeah. but yeah, that now that was a, a twist I didn't see coming. She she had a few twists in this story that yeah. um I was like, oh, I like that one. Mm-hmm. I like that little twist, but I did like the um. You know, the twist with Callum. Kalen? Callum? 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 Yeah, that's okay, how Callum. I thought her. Yeah. Right. I know that's the only thing about audio is sometimes you can't get the spelling or the, you know, of their name. So, yeah, yeah him. I, I did not see that coming with him. Um, and I, were you, was it just me or did, I kept expecting something bad out of Nick too. I'm like, wait a minute. Okay. So, okay. Alma was trying to imply that Nick was this horrible kid. She didn't even trust that he was where he said he was yeah. when his father came through and killed her, his brother and tried to kill him. 
Yeah. So I'm I like, oh no. I was, I was expecting him to, I'm not sure exactly, but I, I, I thought he was going to do something horrible to Carly. Because I almost thought that, well, she could have, I almost thought Carly was going to have the same fate as her aunt. You know, since everything was being mirrored. So, um, and I think that probably was the way she she wanted to throw us. Here you have Cal, Callum. Oh, Callum. He was basically kind of like the good guy, working at the library, doing all this, you, you know, and following all the rules. And then you have Nick, you know, who after his father went to jail and his brother died, went down a horrible path, you know, drinking and driving and Elma's picking him up and putting him in the drunk tank. And, you know, so I was thinking that he was going to be was going to be, you know, the bad guy. And, you know, he saw the ghost, too. And he's living in this whole, you know, he was living in the motel. Which is weird. Um, he's like, that's the only place I can sleep. But he's like, this ghost be coming in my room. But, I mean, that's the only place I can sleep. Yeah. But then I thought, too, after that, I was like, after what he saw with his father, because we didn't really know the extent, mm-hmm. you know, uh, we knew that dad killed, you know, the brother. So he's probably thinking, after what I saw, ghosts... <laughs> That's I'm not nothing. scared. Yeah. Right. I just saw my dad murder my brother and I was supposed to be murdered, you know, and I didn't realize that. Well, I don't think the reader knew that period until the end because mm-hmm. his dad, you know, was hearing voices and had basically planned to kill him and his brother. Yeah. So, you know, living in a motel with some ghosts, that was the least of his concerns, you know? So, mm-hmm. um, I really did. I thought Nick was going to be, was going to probably do something to her. I thought he was going to be the bad guy, the Callum yeah. in the story. So, but he was, um, but Callum was the bad guy for um, Carly's timeline, Carly. and her yeah. his grandfather was the bad guy for Viv's timeline. And of course, all things come full circle. So, of course, Callum did not live. <laughs> And no. no one killed him, but duh, 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 Betty, Betty killed him. Like, well, you go, well, you are the grandson of this wretched man who was here forever. I'm going to kill anybody that is in your family that come to this motel. Right. Your bloodline. Yes. Just all of them. And she wreaked havoc. I mean, to the point where. Uh, you know, it looked like he had an aneurysm or something. You know, it was something yeah. unidentifiable. Because at first they were trying to see if Carly or or Nick killed him. Nick. They had a they had kept Nick in right. the you know police uh thing, but of course they didn't keep him. Um, yeah. but now like they come back, and that place looks night and day. Like it was already run down, but this place is condemned now. You can't even water everywhere things coming down they're like uh black how do you mold. work black mold i'm like how does yeah. black mold appear overnight or that made me think that betty and the other ghost like if you like i've seen a movie like this you go as the person you're being influenced by those ghosts so you're seeing things the way they want you to see them mm-hmm. and then when yeah. after she got her revenge she let go of all of them let go of the illusion they, like were, they were creating holding yeah and this is what's left. And this is what really, this is what this place really looks like. So to think you're coming in a place every day, dripping water, black mold, and you think you're seeing a regular room. Yeah. That's creepy. Yeah. Because I don't think Betty actually did that. Da- I mean, she did the damage, but I feel like that was natural but not damage. That time- no, right. Not in that quick of a time span. Right. You know, like the I, black I mold was too. the giveaway. You can't grow that in an hour. No. And, you know, for he was saying like the drywall and all that, it was crumbling. Mm-hmm. It was like, it, you know, it was years of deterioration, basically, um, the officer was saying to the point where, you know, it had to be condemned. And like you were saying, those things could not have happened in that. It, that wasn't even a day's worth of time. So the time that Callum died, 
you know, it, that was what, within hours? It was like a couple of hours. So like yeah. alongside this, you know, Carly went back to that hotel initially to get this um, document out of the vending machine that her aunt right. had wrote. So her aunt squeals up <laughs> and she's telling Carly, get the car, let's go. So they go and ride off and have pie or something and talk. And soup, yeah, right. Yeah, soup. And they're, all this stuff is going on while they are gone. Uh, and they were not gone more than an hour or two. They weren't gone that long. No, not at all. So, yeah, like you said, I think Betty was um, holding on for dear things. And then the last seed of Simon Hess came through and Betty was like, oh, shit. <laughs> like, I'm gonna oh, use all my no. energy trying to take like, this oh, MF her out. Yeah. Right. Oh hell no. Yeah. I'm about to wreak havoc on the Sundown Motel. It's and over. he was a bad seed too. I mean, he tried. He did try to kill Carly. He tried it. Yeah. yeah. He did. He uh he tried to push her in the um. Well, he did push her in the pool, hoping yeah. she was gonna die. And then what else? He came back, right? Isn't that how? He did come back. Right. He came back. So he was trying to do something. It wasn't like, you know, um, that was it. He was trying to seek revenge for Mm -hmm. his grandfather. So it didn't work. But like, I'm like, that's the sins of my damn eye. Why you try to take me out? I ain't do it. I didn't kill a man. What you? (laughs) No. Yeah. But he was a little off. So he probably just thought. My my life is, you know, you, you know, not, I don't know. I'm just thinking, he's probably thinking, well, my life could have been different if my grandfather uh, didn't do this, this, and that. So, And, you know, he didn't realize that his grandfather was a serial killer. He just thought his grandfather ran off. Yeah. Because they didn't find the body. Mm-hmm. Well, well, they found the body later. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, he just thought, did he know? I think he found out that that was his grandfather in that car. Yeah, I think that is what set him off because right. I think that kind of got out all around the same time because I remember, yeah. um, you know, she was rushing back to Nick to kind of tell him what happened. Um, yeah. Because, oh, that's you know, right. Because that's when he confronted her and she had to drive over to Marnie's house or was it Alma's house to kind of get away from him. Right. She and went she to Alma's house because she's Alma's the ex retired cop. So, right. and he followed her all the way to his house. Kellum did. Yeah, that's right. It's just, and with this being a small town, they probably knew that this was, you know, probably a, a, a ex cop. But yeah, that is right. He did confront and say, oh, isn't that funny that how um, your aunt goes missing and my grandfather goes missing too or something. So, yeah, mm-hmm. just. <sighs> yeah, because then I'm almost like, uh, do you need some help? <laughs> you know, she opened the door like, what's going on out here? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And then come to find out that Vivian, her aunt, was the one that left the documents for her, you know, for her to read through it. You see all the proof that she had. Um, right. And then she ended up turning herself in. She was living as, uh, she had this crazy name. I wrote it down. She was living Christine as Fawcett. Christine, uh, what is it? Fawcett. 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 Yes, yeah, like, like Farrah Fawcett. Fawcett. <laughs> she said that like Farrah Fawcett. I know it because I love Farrah Fawcett. Oh my gosh. But I'm like, she got away with it this whole time, but then she gave herself up. I'm like, well. Yeah. Yeah, she probably just, I think she realized at the end that, you know, like she was saying, Nick wasn't the one who did wrong. She was the one who did wrong. And, you know, she wound up having cancer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think she She had cancer a second around when she was in jail. Yeah. So I think she just kind of was like, you know what, I'm tired of being on the run. But you know what? And before I forget, the one thing that was kind of key in this in this story some of the key points she was going to school I mean she was going to New York to be an actress and she had taken some acting classes so you know like when she was making some of those phone calls she was using different voices and that's how she fooled Carly at the end you know with um go look for the the um the journal in Mm -hmm. the um the vending machine and she thought that was Elma who called her and it was really 
her aunt using mm-hmm. a different voice because she said, you know what? She never did identify herself as Ama. She just recognized the voice. Yeah. So, you know, that talent of being able to use different voices. And, and you know, that's how she found out the information about Simon Hess, too, calling the different um, insurance uh, well, call the insurance company about the car because she got the license. Well, she um, called the wife first. She was okay. like, oh, I'm calling right. it. You know, she pretends she was from the scheduling company. Right. And then I think that's how she got like, she got some information from there. And then she kept calling. <laughs> she used yeah. Alma. Hello, I'm, det- I'm a police officer, whatever, whatever. And then Alma later was like, do you know it's illegal to impersonate <laughs> a police officer? <laughs> She's like, forget about that. Forget about that. That's, that's not important. Yeah, it's that's not, not important. important right now. Right. It's not important. But I got this information. Yeah. yeah. I caught so, a serial killer. <laughs> right. But yeah, those, you know, that acting and the voice, uh, voice um, impersonations or, you know, just using the different voices uh, was was very key in some parts of this story. So I, I forgot to, to mention that. But yeah, the, the aunt was alive the whole time, yeah. um, knew her niece was there in town and kind of was, you know, at the end leading her. Um, to the answers of um, from the story. And then she got to the point, she was like, okay, we need to meet. <laughs> yeah, she had to. Um, but I did like the end. They kind of skipped ahead three months. I, I liked how, that, how they wrapped that up there. So we knew that the sundown owner, Chris, closed the business. He did condemn the building. And uh, he had to. He, yeah, he had to. <laughs> he put it up for sale. And of course, he took the insurance money. Um, yeah. And Alma, she still checks in with Carly, but they don't really talk about much of anything because she still won't answer questions. <laughs> She's like, like, who? I don't know who that person is. I don't know who is. that is, yeah. But if I did like, know somebody like that, I would think I that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yep, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a sister. I don't know who you could be talking about. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. And then, of yeah. course, that's when we find out Vivian has cancer again. And of course, the cute little uh, ex- I was waiting for Carly and Nick to hook up all the way. I was like, oh, they waited to the end. But this is a situation where it didn't bother me that they yeah. got together in the end. Because right. it was months later, and they were still yep. just dating. They weren't all like googly eyed, like you know. It was a different situation, and this is it how was. You, this is how you do it, right, people? If you want to yeah. throw a relationship in on this yeah. kind of book, this is where you do it. I was waiting for this. I enjoyed that too because yeah. the whole time, you know, she had a crush, and and it wasn't even you know it the way the author wrote it. It wasn't blatant. It was just. You could kind of tell, oh, his blue eye. And then it was like back to business. You know, they stuck to the business. But in the end, like you said, the three months later, and he was like, um, this is date number 10. And she's like, no, it's not. This is number nine. My first was, I was in pajamas. And he was like, but, you, and I was like, oh, see, this That is was cute. cute. He's like, did I cute. take you home? <laughs> did I buy you medicine and bring it to I you? you? <laughs> right. I bought all the medicine. She's like, I was in sweats. That's not a date. And I was like, my heart. I was yeah. like, perfect. Just yeah. perfect. We, Because we could have heard that earlier in the story and it would have been like, come on, people. There's yeah. a murder to be solved. You right. Know, Let's we don't focus. Hear about, right. Yeah. We don't want to hear about your buddy relationship. Right. But she she let the, the crime be solved and, you know, everybody's life came to, you know, we fit, we saw how everybody's life ended and then you bring in some happy happy joy joy yeah it wasn't like the next day and we're holding hands in the cab of the truck like no yeah yeah unrealistic right this was much better I believe this more and it was kind of gave me a happy ending right because Carly even went home for a little bit and came back Mm -hmm. so I was really impressed with you know I was like see it they stuck it out Mm -hmm. so yeah I I was pleased with that the author delivered and I mean uh, even 
uh, with the slow start, I feel like there were so many positives going on with this story and how I felt at the end of the story that that almost negated the slow start. I was like, it was almost, it was worth it because in the end there were so, and I got to give the author credit. There was a lot going on between the past and the present, uh, clear, all yes. of these moving parts, all of the the, yeah. the mystery then and now, and it's like all these moving parts that cross over into the two timelines. There was a lot going on, and she kept it straight. Yeah, because like you were saying, you were had notes. I had notes too because as I was listening, I'm like, this has got to be oh, that's got to be important. And it was. There was. There was a lot of characters. Mm-hmm. Um, it was. It was a lot of moving parts. Uh, a few red herring. But I loved it. It was, you know, um, I started it on Sunday because I wanted to, it to be fresh. Um, and then, like, was it yesterday? I kind of just pushed through. And it was, you know, it, and it wasn't one of those ones where I was like, I'm pushing through. No, I was truly excited to get back to it and to continue and figure out whatever the heck, where was Vivian? Yeah. And who was killing you know, because it was two mysteries, basically. Mm-hmm. You know, where was Vivian and who was who killed these women? Well, yeah. Yeah. Where was Vivian? Vivian Was she murdered? Did she run away? And who killed these women mm-hmm. um, in Fell, New York? So, um, yeah, she did. She did a great job keeping all that together. And it was it was pretty seamless. It was. Yeah. It was. Um yeah, very good. Okay, let's rate the thing. Let's go ahead and rate it. Um, oh no, we need to talk about the audiobook narrators real fast. Let's talk about the audiobook okay. narrators. Okay. So um there were two, one for Carly and one for Vivian. And they actually said who did what uh okay. at the end of the audiobook. I wrote it down so I knew I wouldn't remember. Okay, because I'm like, I can't remember. So Brittany Presley was Carly. And Kirsten Potter was Vivian. Okay. Um, I think I enjoyed Vivian's voice better. Uh, Carly's voice was kind of whiny to me for a little while. It took me a little while to kind of like adjust adjust to it. But I did eventually and it was fine. But I just remember right off uh, Vivian's voice was easier for me to digest initially. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the thing with um, Carly's, the uh, the narrator for Carly, because she also narrated for Heather, and Heather, the roommate, was very whiny. Mm-hmm. And I had to kind of, and I think there were at points where the differentiation, it was like she almost forgot that Heather, this is Carly, you know, and then... I think she she got into the groove of it because I felt that same way that now who's whinier and I could see Heather really being the whiny word because you know she was a little quirky yeah so um, but yeah I I did enjoy uh, Vivian's narrator um, I didn't have any hangups really about them like you said except for you know the the start or that blend of heather and um carly yeah they did great with the male voices yeah um no issues it was good i mean Uh, but overall they did a stellar job between the two of them um once i got past the whininess and i adjusted it was fine (laughs) yeah right yeah and of course you know as this is um who who was the uh was Berkeley was the publisher and Penguin Audio did the uh, audio book. So of course, as expected, the quality of the production was good. Yeah, yeah. it was. There mm-hmm. were, there was a, yeah. Okay. It was, it was good. I think I might've noticed one little thing, but it wasn't enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was, it was a good Good production. Wonderful. Okay, let's rate the Sundown Motel one to five, no halves. You know how we do. Classy, how did you rate the Sundown Motel by Simone St. James? I gave it four. Same. Same. <laughs> Same. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I enjoyed it. I really, I really did. Um, yeah. I mean, it wasn't like I wanted to give it a five. I didn't really even see myself giving it a five. 
but it was definitely a four. No Agreed. doubt. I yeah. feel like it would have been a five had that initial part for me moved a little faster. That could okay. be one thing that I would say it just, t- it took a minute to start building the world before we could get into it. And it just dragged a little bit on the, f- on the beginning. Uh, but like, if I had been able to jump in it, like, oh my gosh, right away, it would have been a five. Yeah. But. Yeah. Like hook me, hook me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. True. All right. Yay. Yeah. So, okay. So we usually do, you guys know, we usually do an um, adaptation fantasy cast, but because, you know, life, life, yes. guys, life, we didn't do one. Uh, so yeah. you guys aren't going to hear it on the pod, but if you join Patreon, you can catch the after show. Cause we are going to do it live. We are just going to go through <laughs> and try to figure it out together. Okay. We're going to do a, ca- a little quick cast on the after show. So if you're listening now, you should be able to go to Patreon, sign up and hear this after show right now. So that is it. We are done for the day. Classy. You all set. That was good. Yeah, it was. It's been a while since we just didn't have a whole bunch of complaints, I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> right. And we agreed mm-hmm. on a, a book. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, it has been so fun talking to you guys. We hope you enjoy the show. And thanks for checking out this book with us. And stay tuned. Join Facebook group Shelf Addiction Official and find out what we're reading next so you guys won't be spoiled by the conversation. (laughs) (laughs) So until next time, happy reading. Take care, guys. Bye. If you enjoyed today's book chat episode and would like to show your support, there are a few things you can do. Head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a positive five-star review. You can follow me on Twitter at Shelf Addiction. Most importantly, you can share this podcast with friends and family that enjoy all things bookish, including author interviews. Thank you for listening, and until next time, happy reading. Total Wine and More now offers curbside pickup and same-day delivery in Northern Virginia. Have great finds at great prices delivered right to your car or to your door. It's easy to discover the more ways Total Wine and More has you covered at TotalWine.com. Total Wine and More now offers curbside pickup and same-day delivery in Northern Virginia. Have great finds at great prices delivered right to your car or to your door. It's easy to discover the more ways Total Wine and More has you covered at TotalWine.com.